did not wear the equivalent of a Victoria riding habit. Riding side saddle was the equivalent of riding on the back of a convertible in a parade. It was for ceremonial purposes. Not for hunting. Not for hunting, not for traveling. Basically, the clothing that a woman wore for riding to the hunt or for traveling consisted of a pair of the narrow leg pants that we've seen the men wear, over which there is a skirt that fastens to a belt and is absolutely divided from back and front. So she flaps her leg up and there's a flap on either side that protects her from like chaps. Yeah. It worked like chaps. In fact, it was frequently leather. And it protected her legs from brambles and bushes and tears and stuff as she and rode. And kept her warm. And kept her warm and preserved modesty. But I have, for instance, uh, in some of the stories, what they really adapt, the ordinary woman, the avant-garde young girl may well wear jeans, like the uptimers do if they need it. But what I have Pastor Kostenmeyer's wife wearing, and he doesn't notice it until he sees her bending over cleaning out the art, is the equivalent of palazzo pants. A full outfit, but divided in the center which you will find, I am sure, adopted at the time by women who are cleaning the streets, cleaning women who are doing... Women um, who are working. Women who are working. It will be very practical. And remember that women who are working do not go around dragging their skirts no. at ground level. If you look at any picture, of working women during this period, their skirts end somewhere from here to here. Here tends to be migrant workers who are in the fields, uh, and they wear their skirts much shorter with sandals. Uh, for the simple reason, it's not practical to drag around in a field with a lot of skirt. There's a website for one of the 30 year, German 30 Years War reenactment groups. And the wife of the head of it said that originally the women who were the camp followers for their reenactment group, they made their costumes historically accurate with the skirts coming to mid-thigh. And they got so much static from mid spectators mid-calf, mid-calf, and they got so much static from spectators that they gave up and made them long, long. Ah, bummer. Mid-thigh no. would be a bummer. I would, I would yeah, have, I'm sorry. I would have made lots of handouts. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> they gave it, but clothing was practical. Uh, as you can see, Karen has a bodice and skirt that are separate. Right. Uh, this was standard. You did not have full length garments. Even Queen Elizabeth's clothes are made with separate bodices and skirts. Uh, this continued to be true uh, right up through the Civil War in mm -hmm. this country. Uh, a few years ago, the National Society of Daughters of the American Revolution had a really elaborate exhibit of Civil War era clothing. And one was a complete outfit that a woman's ancestor had packed away. She had a royal blue skirt. She had three bodices that hooked to that skirt, made of the same fabric. One of them was a deep low cut with the full sleeves evening. for an evening gown. One was the high-necked but dressy 
for church. One of them was the everyday for going shopping. The investment in those full mid 19th century skirts in sheer yardage was so tremendous that a woman couldn't afford three three, dresses. Dresses. three of them. Dresses. She needed That's brilliant. Yeah. Va variety. And basically the same is true here. You have the jacket and skirt combination. Right. Uh, well, Marie, this, yeah, this with this kind of exposure would only be for certain things. Yeah, Marie de Medici, we have descriptions for wardrobe. And she had three and four bodices to go with the same skirt. Uh, coordinating, again, to give different effects for the same expenditure they, in they could also be and This effort. bodice is what I wear when I'm pregnant, and this bodice is what I wear when I'm not. And no, not that, because of the, the fitting is, but you well, know. Well, no, I mean the, the bodice itself, not the, the under, no, under stuff. No, but I mean the bodice itself, no, she's using it, she'll have a skirt, yeah. which has, you know, struck embroidered panels in three different colors. She'll have a bodice in each of those colors so that it gives the impression of being a different outfit without having to go to the expense of having that skirt multiplied every time. Uh, they varied the sleeves. That's why the sleeves fastened on with hooks and eyes instead of being sewed in. You could, you could, but let me finish, you could have a bodice with sleeves that coordinated with your skirt, sleeves that coordinated with the bodice, sleeves that coordinated with your hat. You hook them in. That's why frequently they look a little wrinkled around the shoulders and the paintings because they weren't sewed in smoothly. They were fastened on with those eyes. Question? Yeah, uh, back when you were saying that um, the women would wear their hair uncovered, um, mm -hmm. I'm doing research for a novel I'm working on. I'm using a history of costume and they talk about the wimples that um, observant noble women in France and Germany would wear in that time period. I'm wondering in the how often in, in the time 1630s. Period. I've s I've I've seen wimples in the 1580s, the yeah, 1590s. Uh, wait a minute. We're going to come do two things. Women in mourning wore wimples and covered even their mouths for a year okay. after their husbands died. This was a sign of mourning. They didn't normally, your ordinary woman couldn't afford to go into a separate set of mourning clothes. Very wealthy people could, like queens and so forth. But ordinarily, your sign of mourning was to right. put on the widow's cap and the wrap around. So mourning would be an occasion. Otherwise, uh, I'm just wondering when the custom died out and how often. It would not have been at all practical to wear it around the house. Uh, can you imagine trying to cook on a fireplace with one of well, those? Well, these are no, noble women, so I don't think they're Oh, you're talking about a different thing altogether. Noble women uh, did go into full mourning, full formal mourning. Uh, Okay, although wasn't, wasn't although it's not going to be what we think of as mourning, uh, I think it's Dave Dingwall who in one of his stories snuck in that lovely comment for England in the 1630s. A man is thinking about his sister-in-law and says, the yellow of mourning did not become her. <laughs> At this time, Mourning in England was a kind of mustard yellow rather than black. You have um, to look France at in this period, upper class mourning was black. But again, black was a show off color. It was expensive. You were you were saying for wealthy women the wimples for wealthy women. When did they come into fashion? When did they Oh, they oh, were. They'd been around they since were the early Middle Ages. Medieval, Basically, yeah. when did they go out? Gorg, let's everybody look at Gorg's hat. No, leave it on your head. Picture Gorg's hat with an attached scarf back and front, 
and then bring the scarf around, cross it in front, and tie it in back. And you have your basic wimple, right. which has been, I have a winter hat that is constructed precisely the same way. And if it's not quite that cold that day, I can just fold up the attached scarf, stick it up into the crown of the hat, and go out wearing a hat. As Are a you fashion. saying wimple or wimple? Wimple. W i m p l e. Wimple. Wimple. Uh, yeah, that, I know. I'm just wondering when it. When the Victorians uh, were were notorious for when they wrote about costume, putting Victorian values into the costumes that they saw. Uh, uh, I can't tell you when it went out for the simple reason that over a period of 500 years it had been in and out and in and out. Okay. Uh, it Why came back it? in in the 1670s and was fashionable again for a while up into the 18th century. What's the period of your book? So, oh, I'm sorry. so what's the exact period that you need? Because well, it's, it's high fantasy. And it's, oh, it's, it's high. Well, it's, I you can have a wimple. You can have whatever you want. Yeah, whatever you want a wimple. Yeah, I, 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 want a wimple. I, I have a reason for it. So I, I'm, I'm sure I can do that. But I know there are people. I'm learning in this room. There are people who pay much attention. <laughs> oh, you mean the costume Nazis? <laughs> I didn't say that. No, but I did. But, I mean. but answer the question then. When's your high fantasy set? Um, I would it's, it's like 1600s or early 1600s. Don't have wimples. No wimples. No wimples? It's unless, that yeah. unless you have a widow in mourning, in which case she'll wear a wimple. There and it's probably <laughs> yellow. <laughs> If she's in England, yellow. Uh, if she's very rich in Holland, it's black. White. Or white. Or white. Uh, the wimple is like Which is just white as expensive. because it's linen. Right. Bleached. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hear everyone. It's fine. No, no it's, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's why we, That's why we do these things. We live on the crash here. 1632. Uh, we're five minutes over, but I'll add one thing. There are only so many ways to cover the human torso and limbs, which means that the same fashions have been in and out and in and out over the centuries. Uh, if you look at ancient Greece and look at Regency England, the lines of the clothing are essentially the same. There's a Byzantine revival here. There's, there's only so much you can do with it. Thank you all. Yeah.